Chapter 4 Tying a long rope to the halter, he walked me out of the stable. I went with him because Zoe was out there looking back over her shoulder at me and I was always happy to go anywhere and with anyone as long as she was with me. All the while I noticed that Albert's father was speaking in a hushed voice and looking around him like a thief. He must have known that I would follow old Zoe for he roped me up to her saddle and led us both quietly out over the yard, down the track and over the bridge. Once in the lane he mounted Zoe swiftly and we trotted up the hill and into the village. He never spoke a word to either of us. I knew the road well enough, of course, for I had been there often enough with Albert, and indeed I loved going there, because there were always other horses to meet and people to see. It was in the village, only a short time before, that I had met my first motor car outside the post office, and had stiffened with fear as it rattled past, but I had stood steady, and I remember that Albert had made a great fuss of me after that. But now, as we neared the village, I could see that several motor cars were parked up around the green, and there was a greater gathering of men and horses than I had ever seen. Excited as I was, I remember that a sense of deep apprehension came over me as we trotted up to the village. There were men in khaki uniforms everywhere, and then, as Albert's father dismounted and led us up past the church towards the green, a military band struck up a rousing, pounding march. The pulse of the great bass drum beat out through the village, and there were children everywhere, some marching up and down with broomsticks over their shoulders, and some leaning out of windows, waving flags. As we approached the flagpole, in the centre of the green, where the Union Jack hung limp in the sun against the white pole, an officer pushed through the crowd towards us. He was tall and elegant in his jodhpurs, and Sam Brown belt, with a silver sword at his side. He shook Albert's father by the hand. "'I told you I'd come, Captain Nichols, sir,' said Albert's father." It's because I need the money, you understand. Wouldn't part with a horse like this, lest I had to. Well, farmer, said the officer, nodding his appreciation as he looked me over. I thought you'd be exaggerating when we talked in the George last night. Finest horse in the parish, you said. But then everyone says that. But this one is different. I can see that. And he smoothed my neck gently and scratched me behind my ears. Both his hand and his voice were kind, and I did not shrink away from him. You're right, farmer. He'd make a fine mount for any regiment, and we'd be proud to have him. I wouldn't mind using him myself. No, I wouldn't mind at all. If he turns out to be all he looks, then he'd suit me well enough. Fine-looking animal, no question about it. Forty pounds you'll pay me, Captain Nichols, like you promised yesterday. Albert's father said in a voice that was unnaturally low, almost as if he did not want to be heard by anyone else. I can't let him go for a penny less. Man's got to live. That's what I promised you last evening, farmer, Captain Nichols said, opening my mouth and examining my teeth. He's a fine young horse. Strong neck, sloping shoulder, straight fetlocks. Done much work, is he? Hunted him out yet, have you? My son rides him out every day, said Albert's father. Goes like a racer, jumps like a hunter, he tells me. Well, said the officer, as long as our vet passes him as fit and sound in wind and limb, you'll have your forty pounds, as we agreed. I can't be long, sir, Albert's father said, glancing back over his shoulder. I have to get back. I have my work to to see to. Well, we're busy recruiting in the village as well as buying, said the officer, but we'll be as quick as we can for you. True, there's a lot more good men, volunteers, than there are good horses in these parts, and the vet doesn't have to examine the men, does he? You'll wait here. I'll only be a few minutes. Captain Nichols led me away through the archway opposite the public house, and into a large garden beyond where there were men in white coats, and a uniformed clerk sitting down at a table taking notes. I thought I heard old Zoe calling after me, so I shouted back to reassure her, for I felt no fear at this moment. I was too interested in what was going on around me. The officer talked to me gently as we walked away, so I went along almost eagerly. The vet, a small bustling man with a bushy black moustache, prodded me all over, lifted each of my feet to examine them, which I objected to, and then peered into my eyes and my mouth, sniffing at my breath. Then I was trotted around and around the garden before he pronounced me a perfect specimen. Sound as a bell, fit for anything. Cavalry or artillery, were the words he used. No splints, no curbs, good feet and teeth. Buy him, Captain, he said. 
He's a good one. I was led back to Albert's father, who took the offered notes from Captain Nichols, stuffing them quickly into his trouser pocket. You'll look after him, sir, he said. You'll see he comes to no harm. My son's very fond of him, you see. He reached out and brushed my nose with his hand. There were tears filling his eyes. At that moment, he became almost a likeable man for me. You'll be all right, son, he whispered to me. You won't understand, and neither will Albert. But unless I sell you, I can't keep up with the mortgage, and we'll lose the farm. I've treated you badly. I've treated everyone bad. I know it, and I'm sorry for it. As he walked away from me, leading Zoe behind him, his head was lowered, and he looked suddenly a shrunken man. It was then that I fully realised I was being abandoned and I began to neigh, a high-pitched cry of pain and anxiety that shrieked out through the village. Even old Zoe, obedient and placid as she always was, stopped and would not be moved on no matter how hard Albert's father pulled her. She turned, tossed up her head and shouted her farewell, but her cries became weaker and she was finally dragged away and out of my sight. Kind hands tried to contain me and to console me, but I was unconsolable. I had just about given up all hope when I saw my Albert running up towards me through the crowd, his face red with exertion. The band had stopped playing and the entire village looked on as he came up to me and put his arms around my neck. He's sold him, hasn't he? He said quietly, looking up to Captain Nichols, who was holding me. Joey is my horse. He's my horse, and he always will be, no matter who buys him. I can't stop my father from selling him, but if Joey goes with you, I go. I want to join up and stay with him. You've the right spirit for a soldier, young man, said the officer, taking off his peaked cap and wiping his brow with the back of his hand. He had black curly hair and a kind, open look on his face. You've the spirit, but you haven't the years. You're too young, and you know it. Seventeen's the youngest we take. Come back in a year or so, and then we'll see. I look seventeen, Albert said, almost pleading. I'm bigger than most seventeen-year-olds. But even as he spoke, he could see he was getting nowhere. You won't take me then, sir? Not even as a stable boy? I'll do anything, anything. What's your name, young man? Captain Nichols asked. Narricot, sir. Albert Narricot. Well, Mr Narricot, I'm sorry I can't help you. The officer shook his head and replaced his cap. I'm sorry, young man. Regulations. But don't you worry about your Joey. I shall take good care of him until you're ready to join us. You've done a, fi you've done a fine job on him. You should be proud of him. He's a fine, fine horse. But your father needed the money for the farm, and a farm won't run without money. You must know that. I like your spirit, so when you're old enough you must come and join the yeomanry. We shall need men like you, and it will be a long war, I fear, longer than people think. Mention my name. I'm Captain Nichols, and I'd be proud to have you with us. There's no way, then, Albert asked. There's nothing I can do. Nothing, said Captain Nichols. Your horse belongs to the army now, and you're too young to join up. Don't you worry. We'll look after him. I'll take personal care of him, and that's a promise. Albert wriggled my nose for me, as he often did, and stroked my ears. He was trying to smile, but could not. I'll find you again, you old silly, he said quietly. Wherever you are, I'll find you, Joey. Take good care of him, please, sir, till I find him again. There's not another horse like him, not in the whole world. You'll find that out. Say you promise. I promise, said Captain Nichols. I'll do everything I can. And Albert turned and went away through the crowd until I could see him no more.